All right, so let's carry on here now with uh, this new chapter, Galois theory. So after Lagrange, the stage was set. And then Ruffini and Abel uh, proved that the famous theorem that the quintic equation, general quintic equation, is not solvable by radicals. The general quintic, that means degree 5, equation is not solvable by radicals. All right, what does that mean? Well, it means that there's no formula involving analogs of square roots, not just square roots, but cubed roots or higher roots. In, for a fifth degree polynomial, you'd expect there to be fifth roots. But you cannot write down a formula for a general quintic equation involving lots of fifth roots, even if they're nested inside each other and, and different kinds of radicals are involved. So uh, the story is quite interesting because these uh, individuals were, have some prodigies here who died very early deaths. Abel, a brilliant Norwegian mathematician, only lived to 26 or 27 years old. And then Galois, even more extreme, only lived till 21. A uh, hot-headed uh, French brilliant uh, mathematician. So if he had lived, well, both of these two had lived uh, longer, they would have made even greater contributions than they already did. But even, their, uh, even so, in their young lives, they made enormous contributions. Uh, the proofs of Ruffini and Abel were not entirely understood. Uh, other people had to come along and, and maybe make some corrections and, and reinterpret and so on and so forth. So when Galois came along, his question was, um, all right, so the general degree 5 equation is not solvable, but sometimes they are. So he was interested in which equations, which equations are solvable by radicals. If you actually have an equation in front of you, how can you tell whether it is solvable or not? And his idea is that if you have an equation, say degree 5 or degree higher or whatever, then you could associate to that uh, a group of symmetries. He's following Lagrange here. But he introduced a group of symmetries, basically permutations of roots. It's the same kind of thing that Lagrange was looking at. And, but he went further and he associated to these things uh, fields. Okay, what's a field? So a field is basically an arithmetical domain, which is a lot like the rational numbers, where you have your four operations of addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. And of course, the standard field is the field of rational numbers. But Galois also uh, realized that it was possible to consider larger fields. For example, you might um, say have field where you adjoin um, say a variable. So this say you know the rational number is by rat or maybe q of p. Then q of p would be rational functions in a variable p. For example maybe something like p q minus 2 p over 1 plus or 1 minus 7 p squared. So this is called a rational function in the variable p. And you can add these two things. You can add such things and multiply them and subtract them and divide them. And they have the same kinds of algebraic structure as does the, the field uh, q. So this kind of uh, algebraic object, the, the idea of a field, Galois' idea is to somehow see that there was a correspondence between groups and fields. And this is really what allowed him to basically set out a theory of, of how to address this interesting question. All right, so to give you a sense of that, and I'm going into uh, you know, considerable details that are required if you can do it properly, I want to have a look at an example. And this example is uh, it's a simple example, but it's still instructive. It comes from uh, 
relatively recent work, uh, maybe 50 years ago, by Variest. And it's nicely laid out in Morris Klein's monumental uh, book volumes on the history of mathematics called Mathematical Thought um, from Ancient to Modern Times. Okay. Highly recommended uh, book. Okay, so what we're doing is we're looking at a relatively simple equation, this fourth degree equation here, x to the fourth plus px squared plus q equals zero. The advantage in that is that it's really quadratic in x, so we can actually write down all the solutions. We can see what's going on in this case. Because you can solve the quadratic equation for x squared, that's basically what I've done inside here, and then you can take the square root of that, plus or minus square roots, to get four zeros. And we don't really care about uh, you know, what p and q are. You can almost think of them as being variables here. So when we write p squared minus 4q square root, let's call that w, what this really means is that we're introducing a symbol w is a symbol uh, such that if you square it, then you get p squared minus 4q. All right, so what would Galois have uh, done to, to try to solve this equation if we didn't already know this? So let's have a look at relations satisfied by these four roots, x1, x2, x3, and x4. First, we should introduce a, a, a field. So let's let r be q adjoined p and q. p and q are exactly these variables that are appearing there. So this is the field of rational functions. in variables p and q. All right, so these four numbers satisfy certain relations. Let's see what the relations are. Relations actually in this uh, field are. Relations are pretty simple because we see that x1 and x2 are negatives of each other. So x1 plus x2 happens to equal 0, and x3 plus x4 also happens to equal 0. That's completely obvious because this one is just the negative of this one. Right. So those are two relations satisfied by these four solutions, whatever they might really be. Okay, now Galois would say, all right, let's ask what are the permutations of these four things that maintain these relations? So these relations, these are invariant under certain permutations of the four numbers x1, x2, x3, x4. In fact, the permutations are Right, D4, which consists of the identity 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, 1, 3, 2, 4, 1, 4, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2, 4. And uh, 1, 4, 2, 3. Okay, it's actually a set, I suppose. So this is a subgroup of the full group of permutations. And I'm writing things in cycle form in the way that I talked about in my last lecture. So what do we mean here? So if you take 1, 2, what does it do? It just permutes x1 and x2. If you permute x1 and x2, then this relation is still satisfied. If you permute 3 and 4, the relation is still satisfied. In fact, we could permute 1, 2, and 3, 4, and the relation is still satisfied. However, you are not allowed to permute 1 and 3. 
That's not in this list. If we permuted x1 and x3, interchange them, then this, this, uh, these two relations would no longer be satisfied. So the, the relations satisfied by the roots are reflected, their symmetry is reflected in this group of permutations which preserves those relations. Now let's consider this point. x1 <coughs> squared minus x3 squared. Let's have a look at that. Here's x1, here's x3 squared. If we square them, these square roots are going to disappear. Then we take the difference, this minus p is going to disappear, and we're just going to get square root of p squared minus 4q. Now let's call this thing w. Then this is now a relation, let's call this relation uh, 1. Okay. And this is then, is a relation in, in a bigger field. In a field that we get by taking the R field that we started with and adjoining W. So if we make a bigger field by extending our field of rational functions to include not just P and Q but also this new object W, then this becomes a relation that lives inside R of W. In other words, all the coefficients belong to this field. So it's a bigger field. All right, but uh, from one, from our relation over there, uh, x1 is equal to minus x2. We also know that uh, x1 squared equals x2 squared, and x3 squared equals x4 squared. That's essentially uh, what we've already observed. So relation number two is invariant under which permutations? Not all the permutations that we had previously are going to preserve this relation. Some of them will. The ones which will are E and 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 3, 4. So note that 1, 3, 2, 4 does not. If we perform the operation of the permutation 1, 3 interchange and 2, 4 interchange, if we interchange 1 and 3, then this becomes its negative. So this is no longer a, a relation that's preserved under this particular transformation. So what's happened is that we've added we made our field bigger, we've gotten a new relation, but now the set of permutations that preserves our relations has shrunk from what I call D4 over there to what I'm calling K here now. Okay, so that's, uh, that's interesting. And um, now let's go a little bit further. Now let's introduce another quantity, let's call it mu. So this is going to be square root of minus p minus w over 2. Uh, so in other words, it's uh, exactly um, what we're calling uh, x3 here. And what that really means is that we're introducing a new thing called mu. And if we ever have mu squared in our system, then we automatically can replace this with minus p minus w over 2. All right, so then we have a new relation. Then we have a new relation, which is uh, that x3 minus x4 equals um, 2 mu. That's a relation in, maybe I should call it, let me call this thing r prime, this <coughs> one here. 
and now our double prime will be r prime uh, joined with mu. Now I should give this one a name. Let's call it uh, relation three. Relation one, relation two, and relation three. So this is a new relation that's valid because we extending our, our field by adjoining another abstract object subject to some particular algebraic relation. The field's gotten bigger, we've gotten a new relation, but that means that the set of symmetries, or the set of permutations that preserves this new relation as well as the other ones, is cut down yet again. So this is now invariant under, if we look at the previous group, not all of them will preserve this. In particular, this one will not preserve it. If we interchange three and four, then this relation is no longer true, it's replaced with its uh, negative there. However, interchanging one and two doesn't do anything to this. So the new group is Z2, which is just uh, E together with 1, 2. Uh, let me go over here now. And so finally, Let's introduce yet another new variable, it's called eta, which is the other thing that we kind of need to get all these zeros, minus p plus w over 2. w is just a square root of p squared minus 4q. And let's define our triple prime to be our double prime adjoined this eta. All right, then we have a new relation that x1 minus x2 equals 2 eta. Now we should call that 4. So this is a relation in R cubed. And now it's invariant. It is invariant only under the identity group, which is just E. So we end up getting this so corresponding family of groups and corresponding family of fields. So at the level of groups, we had E inside Z2, inside what we call K, inside D4. And at the level of fields, we had this uh, field that we originally started with R, which was just the field uh, adjoined the variables P and Q. And then um, contained inside that is R prime, which was, I remind you, R adjoined W. And then inside that is R double prime, which was uh, R prime adjoined uh, mu. And then inside, that's inside R triple prime, which was R double prime adjoined eta. And so this is a correspondence. And it's really this chain of groups of symmetries of the zeros corresponding to this chain of fields of things that you have to, of radicals that you have to adjoin. Each one of these corresponds to making a square root, adjoining a, a, a radical that really corresponds to solving the equation. So solving the equations, in some sense, involves starting here, finding a chain of 
uh, subgroups to get all the way down to the identity, the trivial subgroup, and seeing what the corresponding uh, things that you have to adjoin to the fields are to get down uh, to here. By the time we've gotten down here, our solutions are all in here. All right, so this is a very lightning quick introduction of Galois theory, but this is a fundamental kind of correspondence. The idea of groups and fields uh, corresponding. All right. and, um, and it's sort of in an inverse way. So here, the, as we're going in this direction, the groups are getting smaller, but the fields are getting larger. With this uh, strategy, so Galois realized that at the level of groups, groups of symmetries of uh, zeros, uh, in order for in order for an equation to be solvable by radicals, uh, we have to have a chain. Have to have a, a chain of subgroups. Okay, maybe uh, I'll start on this side. G one and uh, Inside of that is G2, all the way up to uh, GK, which is just uh, the identity. With the additional properties, that one G2 is normal, or to say GK, GN is normal inside uh, Gn minus one, okay, and that's a technical thing about groups. Basically, it means that if you conjugate uh, Gn, so if you take G, Gn, G inverse, and that's equal to Gn for any uh, G in Gn minus one. So you can roughly think of it as being stable under a conjugation type of action. And the second property is that somehow if you take uh, the bigger uh, group G and minus one and you mod out by the, the uh, subgroup that you need to have a, a cyclic group. This should be uh, a cyclic group corresponding to the equation so x to the p equals uh, a. But the point is that he could reduce the question of whether a given equation has is solvable by radicals to a, a question about the, the group of symmetries of that equation and various subgroups and so-called composition uh, series. And using this, he was able to explain why the five degree equation doesn't have solutions while the previous ones did. So if you take S5, the group of full symmetries, inside it it has alternating group of A5. But this is the only this is the only chain of normal subgroups. And and this one is not cyclic. So this contradicts the, the, what we have to have in order for ha to be able to have a um, solution to equation by radicals. So if the group of symmetries is a full group S5, then we don't get solution by radicals. However, for S4, something different happens. For S4, inside we have A4. And inside we have this subgroup 
K, and inside that we have Z2, and inside that we have uh, E. And this is such a tower that satisfies these uh, things, and it's really the existence of this tower at the level of groups that is responsible for the fact that the quartic solution has a formula by uh, radicals. Quartic equation has a formula. And similarly for S3, S3 inside that we have A3 um, and uh, inside that Z3 and E. And S2, we just, uh, S2 is just. So these, these ones here do satisfy the criterion. This one doesn't, and higher ones also don't. All right, this was a tour de force of, of Galois. He, he wrote it down under trying conditions because, uh, well, he didn't live very long. He was killed in the duel. Um, legend has it that he spent his last uh, evening feverishly writing stuff up um, instead of getting a good night's sleep. But in any case, uh, it took decades for people to understand Galois' work, so it was decades before it was published. And, um, and then, but eventually it became clear that Galois' approach here, not just to really clarify what was going on uh, and pushed Lagrange's ideas further, but also really introduced the importance of, 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 of group theory and the, the strong connection with field theory and abstract algebra. So it was really a big impetus uh, to the growth of abstract algebra. Galois also contributed <coughs> in, in other directions. In particular, Galois also uh, basically introduced the idea of a finite field. Okay. So it turns out that if you take uh, a prime p and you look at, say, the integers mod p, that that's a field which plays a lot of the role, like the rational numbers. And so a lot of these questions can be uh, explored in the context of finite fields as well. So I have to also say just a few words about, uh, you know, I, I think this subject is not entirely uh, finished. I think there's still more work to be done. Many modern treatments of Galois theory uh, don't really spend too much time going back to Galois' original thinking. So I'm hoping this will maybe uh, and interest people in, in the actual historical origins, and I think it's good to have. But also, modern treatments sometimes are a little bit prone to logical weakness in, in the relationship with complex numbers and the fundamental theorem of algebra. So we've talked about the fundamental theorem of algebra, but I really have to say that there's a bit of an elephant in the room here, that, that the fundamental theorem of algebra is, is not logically uh, very uh, solid, in fact. And it really requires infinite processes to, to really pin down the proof. And uh, in, in the modern computer age, a lot of these infinite processes are starting to look increasingly suspect. That you can't easily uh, put them on your computers. So a lot of these arguments are, although they've been accepted more or less historically, I think, I think they're going to be called into question more. So uh, there's a kind of a split between uh, treatments of Galois theory that try to avoid transcendental things and those that actually you know, em employ transcendental things and use examples from the complex numbers. What I've shown you here is in principle uh, doable completely out of the, without any reference to complex numbers. We can just work algebraically in terms of extensions. And that I think is really more in the spirit of Lagrange and Galois and I think that's really where the future is, is going to be. Uh, in this direction. All right, so a very interesting chapter of uh, 19th century mathematics with uh, still lots of uh, applications today.